We're going to go ahead and get started here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wild Sheep webinar series. I'm Amanda Verhuel, the Interim Director at the National Bighorn Sheep Center. Our mission is to provide education and outreach for the national conservation of wild sheep, wildlife, and wild lands. Tonight in our Wild Sheep webinar series, we present chronic wasting disease, emphasizing on epidemiology and transmission. There has been a lot of discussion on CWD lately. Most people agree that it is spreading rapidly. Some believe that it doesn't exist. My 12 year old son harvested his first deer last fall and unfortunately it tested positive for CWD. I realize that there are a lot of unknowns with this disease. <clears throat> It is my hope that our discussion this evening may shed light on a few of those things. Our first panelist this evening is Jessica Jennings Gaines. Jessica currently manages the Wyoming Game and Fish Department's Wildlife Health Laboratory, WHL, in Laramie. Prior to becoming lab manager, she worked within the WHL since starting with Game and Fish in 2004. Jessica moved to Wyoming after finishing her bachelor's and master's degree degrees, hoping to start a career in wildlife. In addition to CWD, the Wildlife Health, La Health Lab monitors wildlife diseases across the state. A few of these diseases include brucellosis in elk and bison, respiratory disease in bighorn sheep, and rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus. Also on our panel tonight is Justin Binfett. Justin is the Wildlife Management Coordinator for the Casper Region of Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and he has been with the agency for over 21 years. Prior to his current position, Justin served as the Douglas and then Casper District Wildlife Biologist. Throughout his career, he has been primarily responsible for wildlife and habitat data collection and analysis, formulation of management recommendations, for example, hunting seasons, interacting with public and stakeholders, and initiating or participating in wildlife research. Justin has worked with CWD issues his entire career as a biologist. <clears throat> Coordinator districts have always occurred within Wyoming's endemic area for CWD. He now serves as the co-chair for the department's internal CWD management team, was a primary author of Wyoming's CWD management plan, has initiated or participated in four large-scale CWD field research projects and has co-authored additional CWD-related publications. Thank you for joining us tonight. And with that, I will pass it over to Jessica. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting Justin and I to the talk tonight. And thank you, everyone who's shown up to listen. All right. So as Amanda said, um, I work at the Wildlife Health Lab um, and that is in Laramie. Um, and just a background on our lab, um, we are charged with monitoring and doing surveillance of wildlife disease across the state. Um, and that involves doing a lot of disease diagnostics. We also participate and collaborate on a lot of research. Uh, we get out into the field when we can to help sample some of these animals. Um, then we bring all that information together and we get that information back out to uh, the department, the public, and state and federal agencies. And we're generally, we're just a resource for wildlife disease info for the department and the public. So we give talks like this. Um, we're always available if you have any disease concerns or questions. Um, phone call away. Just give us a call and, and we can chat about it. So Amanda touched on these. I forgot that I put them in my bio there, but uh, a few of the diseases that we do work on within the lab, um, CWD, of course. Um, if you've had an animal tested, went to a check station or regional office and, and had that sample taken, it got sent into our lab and we did that testing. Uh, we do all the brucellosis testing for wildlife in the state as well. So if you um, ever got a little box in the mail with a blood tube that came from our lab and we tested that for you. Uh, we've been doing surveillance for high path avian influenza the last several years since this new strain showed up. We do the bighorn sheep respiratory um, diagnostics and all of our wild herds. We do surveillance for EHD and blue tongue. Um, lately, we've brought on Mycoplasma bovis. You might have heard of that last winter and spring. We had uh, quite a die off in the pronghorn in the Pine Dell area from this bacteria. Uh, we test for hoof rot, which is something we see this time of year on our feed grounds and elk. 
Um, we have done surveillance for rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus um, over the last couple of years as well. And we do tularemia serology. And if you're from the Dubois area, you've had just about all of this, I think, except for in Bovis, probably. <laughs> but tonight we're here to talk about CWD. So um, chronic wasting disease, I'm sure most of you know, is a fatal degenerative nervous system disease of cervids. And those would be deer, elk, and moose uh, here in Wyoming and reindeer and caribou in other parts of the world. And this disease is very slowly progressing. So the incubation period takes about a year and a half to two years in deer and two to four years in elk. And during this incubation period, that's before they would show signs of the sickness. Um, they just look normal, fat, and healthy. Um, majority of all CWD positive animals that are harvested in Wyoming just look normal. Um, we get a lot of calls from hunters who've got a positive result and um, they're sure that, that our test was wrong. You know, because they say it's that the largest set of antlers they've ever seen, it's fat and it's healthy. Um, but really, those clinical signs that you think of as CWD, the weight loss, the drooling, hair coat changes, behavioral changes, drooping ears, and lack of awareness, they don't really show up until the last four to eight weeks of that disease. Um, and because of that, we also get a lot of folks that I talk to about CWD that say, you know, I've never seen a waster on the landscape. You know, I don't think CWD is as bad as you say, because I'm not seeing these animals. Um, but you have to realize that most of these CWD positive animals are going to be removed from the landscape long before they have time to get to that last four to eight weeks of the disease. Um, we do know that animals that are positive for CWD are more likely to get hit by cars. You know, they're just a little bit slower. The reaction time is a little bit slower. Um, they're just not as aware. Um, and there's some research ongoing right now in Wyoming, and Justin may touch on that, um, where we're seeing that um, predation is also higher for these animals that are CWD positive. Because again, if a mountain lion sitting in a tree looking at a group of deer, um, they're more likely to go for that one in the back. It's a little bit slower, just maybe not paying attention. Um, so a lot of those positives are going to be taken off the landscape long before they get to that clinical phase, um, but we certainly do get calls from landowners that are still seeing some of these clinical animals that we are euthanizing out there on the landscape. So CWD is transmitted um, animal to animal, you know, through those social interactions, also from the environment to the animal. So ingestion of particles that are contaminated with saliva, urine, and feces, because um, that's probably where those prions are, are coming out. Um, and that's exposure through ingesting the soil the plants and the hay that may have these prions, um, exposure through contaminated surfaces. So if they're sharing mineral licks, if they're eating out of feeders or troughs, we know that carcasses that are positive um, have a huge prion sink right there in the soil where they are. Uh, these prions will bind to the soil. They could be actually taken up by plants. And then when the animals are eating grass or, or, or whatever, um, they're getting the prions that way. And they can accumulate in hot spots because you can imagine if you have a bunch of deer that congregate in one area, and if these prions are coming out in the urine and the feces, and they're constantly, you know, excreting these in that one area, you're going to kind of have a high concentration of prions in that area. So CWD prevalence is normally higher in bucks than in does, um, and they attribute this more to behavioral reasons than physiological reasons. Um, we know that bucks spend most of their time in the year um, in these bachelor groups, um, so they're there with other high risk individuals. Um, bucks have a higher home range. You know, they, they go around more, they run into more, um, are exposed to more deer in other areas and maybe other areas that have higher prevalence. Um, and when they do come um, out of those, um, or when they come into the rut, we do know they have very intense social interactions, right? So they're, um, they're courting and they're um, breeding with the females, they're fighting with those other high risk males. Um, and on top of all of that, bucks are just a lot larger, right, uh, as far as deer go. So they're going to be eating more as well. So if they're eating in an area where we've got a lot of prion contamination, they're going to be ingesting more. Um, so we just tend to see the prevalence higher in those bucks and really in those, in those older age bucks. Um, but we do know as prevalence increases in an area, the CWD infection will kind of shift to younger animals and to does because we start to see more environmental transmission. So it's not a matter of coming in contact with those high risk bucks at that point. Um, they're getting it from the environment. And then once it starts to just get prevalence in does, then they're probably starting to pass that on between their interactions with their fawns and with other um, kind of related does in their groups. Um, so far, no prevalence difference has been seen between elk sexes. 
Um, and they also attribute this probably to behavior because we do know that um, elk tend to have the harems in the fall. So they have a lot of females grouping up with a male. Um, and elk also don't tend to just hang out with their related um, elk, that they tend to intermingle with unrelated animals. So there may be more exposure there just coming in contact with different groups. So the pathogen of CWD is a little different than the normal pathogens that you would think of with disease. I think of bacteria and viruses, um, and the CWD pathogen is quite different from those. Um, it is a, a cellular prion protein, and it's normally occurring, sorry, not the CWD one, but there is a normally occurring uh, prion protein uh, that lives in the brain. Um, and all kinds of organisms have this. We're unsure of exactly what the function of this is, um, but it does exist. Um, and what happens is, um, if you look at the photo there on the left, uh, there's a structure of a normal prion. You know, see it has a lot of alpha helix structures, kind of like springs. Um, for whatever reason, um, these things decide to misfold. When they misfold, they look like the structure in the right. They have a lot of beta helix sheets. Um, and when they start to, for whatever reason, when they start to misfold, um, that is where we get this um, infectious prion. Um, so it's called PRP CWD in the case of CWD. Once it folds, it is irreversible. It will not go back to normal um, configuration. It also becomes infectious, meaning when it comes in contact with one of those normal proteins again, um, it will cause the normal protein to also um, misfold. Um, and this kind of happens exponentially. You know, you can think um, one begets one, two begets four, four begets eight. Um, and then that's how you start getting all these accumulations. We also know when they misfold, they start to kind of clump together um, and the body cannot break these down. So for other disease pathogens like bacteria and viruses, um, our immune system works really great, right? We've got all these strategies. If a bacteria comes in, um, we recognize it immediately as an invader. Um, we have an um, innate immune system that attacks it immediately. We have an adaptive immune system that figures out exactly what it is and makes antibodies to fight it. Um, it doesn't work that way with prion, unfortunately, because like I said, this is a normally occurring protein. Your body, well, not your body, a deer's body does not recognize it as a foreign invader. Um, it recognizes it as self. So it does not elicit an immune response at all, which makes vaccine development very difficult. Um, also, bacteria and viruses, you can spray a little Lysol, wipe them down with a little bleach. Um, you can heat them up a little bit, we'll inactivate them. Even UV rays from the sun break down a lot of bacteria and viruses, and that does not work for prions. They do not break down very easily. It takes incineration level temperatures to inactivate these, which is great if you're trying to get rid of a carcass, right? Just incinerate it, it's all gone, um, but it doesn't work well for anything else. Um, you can inactivate them with a 40% bleach solution for five minutes. That's how we clean up around the lab and disinfect. That's how you could clean up your um, knives and any tools that you use for processing your meat. <laughs> However, you're probably aware that bleach and stainless steel don't go very well together. It's pretty hard on stainless steel. Um, these prions can remain infectious in the environment for 16 plus years. They have done research with scrapey prions and they do know that they last that long. So these things are very hardy and they're going to be infectious on the landscape for a long time. And cooking the meat does not make it safe, right? With bacteria and viruses, usually we'll say, well, just cook it and it'll be safe. Um, but again, it's got to be incineration level temperatures um, so you wouldn't have anything left. So the distribution of prions um, across an animal's body would be, um, it can, they've found infectious proteins in the central nervous system. So, you know, the brain, the spinal cord, the spinal fluid, the lymphatic system, which would be lymph nodes and your spleen, salivary gland, intestinal tract, muscles, heart, liver, kidney, antler velvet, blood, urine, saliva, and feces. But this distribution is very dependent on the progression of the disease, right? We know early on in the disease, it's going to show up in the central nervous system first and the lymphatic system of the head. That's why we test tissues from the head, the brain and the lymph nodes. Um, and as the disease progresses, uh, these prions are going to spread out across the body. So they could be in any of these towards the end when it was clinical. And if you look at the photos on the, on the right there, uh, the one of normal brain, you can see how everything looks very tightly packed, very smooth. Um, kind of one color there. These are histological slides of brain tissue. Um, the one on top there is CWD brain. You can see all those clear circles there. And those are actually holes in the brain because like I said, when those um, 
proteins start to misfold, they will start to clump. And as they clump, they're leaving these spaces in the brain. And you can imagine as you accumulate more holes in your brain, you're going to lose a lot more function of that brain. So PRNP is a gene that encodes for this prion protein. Um, and we do know there are polymorphisms, meaning that there are different variations of this gene um, in different animals. Um, no matter, uh, well, these different variations can influence the susceptibility to the disease, so how easy it is for them to get the disease. Um, it can also influence the length of time they survive once they're infected with CWD. So they can make it a lot longer than that, you know, two years we were talking about. Um, but no true resistance has been identified. So no matter what polymorphism they have, it may extend their life. It may take longer for them to get the disease, but they will get the disease and they will die from the disease. Um, there's been no documented immunity or recovery from this disease. Um, and all cervids seem to be susceptible regardless of nutrition or health status, you know? So if they're fat and happy, that doesn't protect them from this prion, unfortunately. So um, there, CWD is not the only prion disease that exists in the world. Um, there, there are a lot actually, and they're very species specific. Um, so the cervids have chronic wasting disease, and we know that um, domestic sheep, especially the black-faced sheep, um, have a prion disease called scrapie. Um, cattle, I know you all have heard of mad cow disease, which is a bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Cats actually have a feline spongiform encephalopathy, and mink have a transmissible mink encephalopathy. And humans have several prion diseases themselves. Um, and here's just a few of the ones that you may have heard of. Um, Kreutzfeldt jakob disease. Um, and uh, this is a very rare disease um, that occurs in humans. Um, and 85% of those cases are sporadic. And that means it's just a random mutation that just happened. Um, no reason whatsoever. Um, just for some reason that that uh, that protein decided to misfold and then started that chain reaction. Um, very rare, one to two cases per one million people. We also know that there is a genetic um, version of this uh, CJD, and that's about five to 15 percent of those cases. And that would be inherited, of course, from your parents. There's another version of the CJD that's called invariant CJD. And this came about directly from people eating tissues that had BSE, right? So we know in the 90s, we had mad cow disease pop up in Europe and in Canada. And for some reason, that BSE was infectious to humans. Um, it is also still very rare. Um, I know at the time it seemed um, like it was everywhere and it was very scary, um, but there's been many regulations put into place um, that came about because they were rendering cattle and then feeding them to other cattle. And probably they had maybe a sporadic case in one of those cattle. Um, but there's a lot of regulations in place today uh, to prevent that. Um, the last, uh, the last uh, human prion disease that I wanted to talk about, which is an interesting case, is called Kuru. And this is found in indigenous tribes in Papua New Guinea. Um, and this has to do with their culture. So in their culture, they believe in eating the brains of their dead. Um, and the theory is that they also must have had one of these sporadic CJD cases in, in their tribe. Um, once that person died, they ate the brain as they do. And that started the chain reaction of that was infectious to the other humans um, there that were eating it. So, um, so that was a very isolated case of prions there. So uh, you guys, I don't know if you've ever Googled CWD. There are tons of laboratory studies. There's tons of research going on right now for all prion diseases, especially CWD. Um, and currently, it's, there still seems to be a very substantial species barrier between CWD and humans. Um, the risk is not completely zero, right? We do know humans get prion diseases. We do know humans were susceptible to BSE. Um, but so far, there seems to be a very substantial species barrier. So the, the risk is very low, um, but a lot is still unknown, right? This is a long uh, progressive disease. Um, there's just a lot that's still unknown, but it does seem like there is a pretty good species barrier there. Um, the CDC, World Health Organization, those groups do um, follow cases of CJD in humans, um, and they trace them back to see if there's any kind of a link to where the person lived. Did they live in an area with CWD? Did they eat a lot of game meat that might've come from an area with CWD? 
there's never been a link demonstrated between any of those things. Um, the CDC and the WHO, though, rec do recommend that you don't eat a positive animal. Um, they err on the side of caution. Um, but, you know, prions, like I said, are not inactivated by cooking them. And they just feel that you should minimize your exposure to those prions. Um, and the Wyoming Game and Fish Department will test your animal for free. So just give us a sample and then you can, you can make a more informed decision on whether you want to consume that animal or not. Um, but decreasing prions in our wild herds will in turn decrease those prions in the environment and will help discre de decrease human exposure overall. So uh, we have no idea when CWD showed up here in Wyoming. Um, modeling suggests it was here in the 1950s. Um, we documented here for the first time in mule deer in 1985 in southeast Wyoming, elk in 1986, white-tailed deer in 1990, and actually in one moose that was over by Bedford in 2008. So this map just kind of gives you an overview of the state of where we have detected CWD. This is in all species and based on their hunt areas. Uh, the pink areas can show you where we've detected it. And you'll see there that there are definitely some pockets left where CWD has not been detected. Um, and some of those may be a matter of sampling, that we just haven't gotten enough samples from those areas um, or just not enough animals are harvested in those areas for us to get a good idea. So I would say in those areas where we haven't detected it, we may just not have, have enough samples from there. Um, and we'll see going forward. This is a video of CWD detection in mule deer hunt areas through time. Um, so this doesn't really depict how the disease is spreading. It's more depicting our sampling strategy probably. You know, when we started out um, looking for CWD, we really focused on the Southeast corner of the state because we knew that's where we found it first. Um, and then through the years, we've kind of adjusted that sampling strategy to now where we sample uh, we really focus on two to three herds in a region in a year, so we can kind of get a larger sample size and a more accurate prevalence. So this will show you how we've detected it over the years and just how it's distributed through the state in mule deer. And here is the same kind of map, but this is looking at elk. And again, you know, that's the first area where we detected it. And it's kind of detected it moved from there and starting to catch up a little bit with our deer herds. So we know that CWD prevalence is not the same throughout the entire state, right? We have some hot spots, we have some areas that are gonna be higher, some areas are gonna be lower. Um, so this map is just showing you prevalence in mule deer herds. Uh, it's five-year average um, from 2019 to 2023, just to increase our sample size so we can kind of give you an accurate prevalence. Um, and if you look here, you'll see the um, project herd, kind of in the middle of the state. If any of you are from Dubois, um, it is just east of there. Um, it is our highest CWD prevalence in mule deer in the state. I believe it probably is the highest prevalence of CWD in the United States at the moment. Unfortunately, it is around 65%. Um, after that, up east of Cody, we do have some high um, CWD prevalence in the Graybull River and the Shoshone River deer herds. And then in southeast Wyoming, down at the Goshen Rim along the southeast corner. And this is our prevalence in elk. You'll notice there's a lot of gray areas. And those gray areas, we just deem we have insufficient data to give out a very accurate prevalence. We want to make sure that people are informed and have good data. Um, and then elk, certainly when we started uh, focusing CWD surveillance, we focused on deer. Um, and now we've started to shift to, to focus on elk as well. And we're getting filling in the data a little better, but we're still missing a lot in some of our elk herds. Um, but you can see Iron Mountain, which is where we first detected CWD and elk, is our highest prevalence between 10 and 13 percent. Um, and then the North Bighorn and South Bighorn um, herd units are coming in behind that between 5 and 10 percent. So I just want to point out just a couple um, uh, hunt areas specifically, just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on there, especially for you folks out there who are from the Dubois area. 
Um, so this is the project herd that I mentioned was the highest prevalence in the state. So in adult male mule deer, it is 65% prevalent for CWD. Um, and usually females are about half the prevalence of males. And here we do see their adult female mule deer are 28%, so a little less than half of what we're seeing in the males. But you also notice this is one of those areas where I said when the prevalence gets higher, we start to see more environmental transmission. You start to see it shifting to younger um, age groups. So our yearling male mule deer, which we do have a low sample size there, I will warn you, and you can look at the 95 percent confidence interval to kind of see where that prevalence would fall. Um, but it's 27%, which is, is pretty high um, in yearlings. Um, and our white-tailed deers are falling fallen in there kind of with our mule deer. So moving on to the Dubois herd, um, we did not have this in our five-year prevalence just because our sample sizes were pretty low, but I still wanted to point this out to you guys just to see how it's, it's going for, for those of you who are in the Dubois area. So our adult male mule deer, the sample size there is, is pretty good. Um, and we're sitting at about 5.7%, which is really great. Um, if you have to have CWD, it's still pretty low. Um, and sample sizes are low, but you can see we haven't really shifted. We're not seeing it in the, in the yearlings. We haven't seen it in the females. We do have it in one yearling male. White-tailed deer, of course, some of those sample sizes are low. So I would implore you, if you um, hunt in this uh, area around Dubois, definitely get us a sample. We'll get some of these sample sizes a little larger and get a little better idea of how much um, we've got there. But 5.7 is pretty good and manageable, I would say. So one more slide, and then we'll move on to Justin. I just wanted to show you, people tend to forget about elk, right? They think this is a disease of deer. Um, and they forget that it can be an elk too. So I just wanted to show you folks, any of you that are from the Dubois area, this is your elk herd, the Wiggins elk herd. And we have a pretty decent sample size from there, 273 animals over the last five years. Um, and we're sitting at a 1.1 prevalence. So still pretty low there. Um, I would still love to get CWD samples from you. So we can just keep a better idea what's going on there. But I will stop sharing and we'll switch over to Justin. Forgot to unmute myself. Um, okay, Amanda, can you see my screen? Yes, Justin. Okay. I can see your screen. All right, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I'm going to apologize in advance because it's a lot of information packed in about 20 minutes here, but. Um, uh, here we go. So CWD research and management. You know, the biggest question we ask ourselves as wildlife managers with the Wyoming Game of Fish is, is this disease impacting our herds? You know, Jessica touched a lot on human health aspect and, and also the surveillance data we have. And that's something Amanda kind of asked her to talk about. But the reality is, is the thing that our agency is most concerned with is, is, is how is this disease actually affecting the herds we manage? So First of all, I got. I have to start out with just a few slides on the caveat here. Um, well, I guess to answer my own question is yes, we we do think it is affecting our herds, especially our mule deer herds. But I have to give the caveat that in Wyoming, and especially in the Mountain West, and is that weather is still by far the largest driver of our mule deer populations. Um, you know, when when we have sufficient habitat quality and availability, it's certainly the most meaningful thing. Um, to, to drive our populations over the long term. You know, when we have things like favorable spring and summer weather conditions that promotes good forage production, that ultimately leads to good nutritional um, body condition of the adult females entering the winter. And that has just kind of a cascade of effects on down the line. And that, and that can mean, you know, it typically will mean that overwinter survival is higher for those adult females. They typically when they're in good nutritional condition, will give um, birth to healthier fawns, um, you know, larger birth weight fawns, that sort of thing. It's really beneficial for these adult females during lactation the following spring and summer, and then ultimately fawn survival um, going into the next year. So, so when we have good environmental conditions, typically, you know, we can see mule deer populations do well, and, and it's common to see adult females bring two fawns um, recruited all the way into adulthood. 
you know, another thing, especially here in Wyoming, that's relevant is, is what was the winter like. So when we have favorable winter weather conditions, we're fairly mild winter, like we have this year, mild temps, we have lots of exposed forage that can really help. It enables these, these animals to move fruit more freely through the snow. Um, it decreases their energetic demands, just of thermal regulation of movement, et cetera, and it exposes more forage. You know, the other, the other things that we, that we do face here in the Mountain West, especially in Wyoming, are periodic droughts. So as we get some unfavorable weather conditions, these can really drive populations in a negative way. When we have, you know, persistent drought, high temperatures, you know, we have less water on the landscape, it cures forage production quickly, plants are just less productive. Um, this, you know, ultimately decreases nutritional condition of adult females. And it tends to lead to poorer fawn birth weights and um, lower overall survival for fawns. And it certainly increases their chances of not making it through that following winter. Um, you know, when we have, especially consecutive years of persistent drought, um, we really, really see declines in, in fawn production and survival across our deer herds. And then, you know, in Wyoming, anyone that, that lived in Wyoming last year and then this year, especially in central and eastern Wyoming, know that it's been a tale of two winters. So, you know, when we would have really severe winters, like for those of you in western Wyoming, you know that the 22-23 winter was the most severe winter in, in, in really Wyoming's recorded weather history. You know, when you have persistent cold temperatures with high snowpack, especially in low elevation winter ranges, it can lead to just direct mortality of all age classes. And when we have when we have winter conditions like this, typically the first thing we see are fawns um, uh, uh, succumbing to winter. And then if winter conditions are severe enough and they persist long enough, ultimately we'll see um, decreased survival or direct mortality on all our age classes, including our adult does. And that's certainly what happened in Western Wyoming this last year. So again, I bring all this up just as a caveat that while we, we feel like um, impacts from CWD are impacting our mule deer herds in the state, um, weather is still the, the, the most important driver. But I do wanna to touch on some research, research updates that has, uh, that has enabled us to, to better understand how this disease is affecting our mule deer. And you're gonna notice that I'm pretty much focusing on mule deer in these conversations and that's for two reasons. So with, uh, with elk, for the most part, where we have CWD at, at higher prevalences in elk, we don't see it at near the prevalence that we do in mule deer, as, as Jessica touched on. And in most cases where we have more endemic CWD in our elk populations, we actually have really, really liberal harvest prescriptions because we have too many elk, especially in central and eastern Wyoming. So we're trying to drive those populations down. And we just don't have any indication that CWD is a limiting factor in the, in the performance of our elk populations. And with whitetails, we can certainly see some suppressed survival where we have a lot of CWD in our whitetail populations, but they can be so prolific, their, their populations are so fecund with, with fawn production and survival that um, uh, when we have good environmental conditions for a few years in a row, whitetails can, can respond rapidly, even in the face of CWD. So, so the bulk of this will focus on mule deer. So here's just a few research projects I just want to touch on. This is just a few. There's certainly a lot more ongoing in Wyoming than what I'm going to present here. But um, you're going to notice some common themes with some of this, and I'm going to talk about some survival rates and, and causes of death. So, so the first one, just to start a few years back, we, um, we collared a bunch of adult um, female mule deer from both right, uh, resident and migratory subpopulations in our upper Powder River herd. So um, that's the Southern Bighorns, like kind of that Buffalo KC country, Northwest of Casper. Um, in, in that study, we, we collared almost 120 adult does. We collected all the vital demographic information that you do as part of any research project over a three year period. And, and we, while we learned lots about seasonal habitat selection and cause specific mortality, meaning like, you know, what ultimately killed those animals. The things that I kind of want to focus on here are um, really this, this study is kind of emblematic of, of other studies that we've done in central Wyoming where we've, we've collared uh, mule deer. And that is, we typically are finding out that in, in most of these cases, chronic wasting disease is either, you know, it 
either tied with the leading cause of death or the second leading cause of death in these studies. And, and this again is in our adult female um, segment of the population. So in this particular study, predation was the leading cause of death, um, but a close second was just clinical CWD. And when I say clinical CWD, I mean, that is, that's a case where the animal went through the entire incubation period, kind of like what Jessica talked about, ultimately withered away, became extremely emaciated, loss of behavioral awareness, et cetera, and then ultimately just curled up and died from CWD without actually being killed by a predator. Um, then, you know, as the case is with mule deer, unfortunately, there's lots of other causes of death that, that can affect them. Sometimes we just don't know. Um, uh, other times there's just emaciation from just simple starvation or vehicle strikes and things like that. So moving on to another study um, just south of Casper. So this is um, what we, the part, portion of Wyoming we call Bates Hole. So it's south of Casper to Alcoba, kind of up to, to the northern end of Shirley Basin there. Um, this is actually an ongoing study. We, uh, we've collared 68 adult mule deer does there. We also captured a whole bunch of neonates for two years that were their newborn fawns. Um, we're gonna track those fawns um, over the course of the next few years to kind of to get a better understanding of, of how in, in an area with pretty high prevalence of this disease, how those fawns navigate the world, especially in cases when they are born to their mom who happens to be CWD positive. So that's something we're trying to understand and also better understand dispersal patterns and things like that to, to try to understand the dynamics of how this disease can spread across the landscape. <clears throat> um, just since that initial capture, uh, unfortunately we've lost 57% uh, of our adult females. Um, again, predation was the leading cause of death, um, but uh, the second leading cause of death was again, clinical CWD. And then, you know, there's a suite of other factors that have resulted in mortalities. One of the take home messages I want folks to, to realize from all this is that, you know, when we wildlife managers um, estimate populations and um, uh, one of the most important metrics that we can look at is what is our annual adult female survival. So when I, you see a number on the slide that says like 0 0.66, that basically means 66% of the adult females survived that 12 month period in 2021. And then we had, you know, another survival of 72% in 2022. And is what I want folks to understand and take away from this is survival rates like that in adult females are exceptionally low. You know, Colorado has a statewide average of, of about 84% survival in their mule deer. Um, so, so it's really, really low. And when we see survival rates that low in our adult females, regardless of cause of death, um, it generally is going to lead to population stagnation at the best, and, and uh, in reality, most of the time, population decline. We also, in the same herd, hung some collars on deer in 2017 um, for a study that was unfortunately cut short because of some collar programming errors, but same thing. We had a 72% sur uh, survival rate back then. So when you, when you start throwing in clinical CWD at such a significant level on top of natural causes of death, such as predation, um, the, the source of the, res, you know, the result of that mortality can be additive, meaning we're losing more deer than we normally would through regular environmental processes. Um, sim, a similar thing um, in, a, in a herd just uh, to the east, this is over south of Glenrock and Douglas. Um, this was kind of some of the seminal work we did with mule deer in Wyoming um, back in from 2010 to 2014. Um, we collared a bunch of deer in the Laprell Valley and just basically kind of the same thing. In this case, um, the causes of death between clinical CWD and mountain lion predation was essentially almost identical. Um, and again, extremely low adult female survival rates during all four years of this study. So now touching on something a little closer to home for at least the Dubois crowd. Jessica already touched on it, so I'll go over this kind of quickly, but, you know, the, the, the country just east of Dubois and that, that Riverton Pavilion project area, you know, unfortunately does exhibit the highest prevalence of CWD we have in Wyoming and likely the, uh, the lower 48 anyway. And, and there we have an ongoing study that just was initiated this last year 
um, where 40 mule deer were collared. And, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a study. This is just an example of some other studies we're embarking on where, where we are hanging collars to try to understand, you know, movement and habitat use of these animals. So ultimately the goal of this is to inform CWD management strategies. So um, it's really important for us to understand, you know, what kind of life history strategy these deer are exhibiting. So are they are they resident deer that just spend year round out in, in ag country or are they migratory deer that summer up at higher elevations and then return? And what we're seeing is we're seeing really disparate, you know, stark differences in CWD prevalence between resident deer and migratory deer where we've looked at it. But <clears throat> again, because uh, of such high prevalence, you know, our adult female survival rates in this area is only 50%, which is, which is really, really poor. So, that's that those that's just a snippet of some of the research that is giving us insights as to just how much this disease may be impacting our our wildlife populations you know we have some additional research um, that's going on that i'm going to skip over fairly quickly in concert with the Bates Hole works out the casper we've also um collared 26 mountain lions um, and monitored their movements and and um, kill sites over the past four years we investigated 1,284 suspected kill sites. And as the intention of this was to try to understand and collect CWD samples from deer and elk that they were killing and or feeding upon um, to try to better understand selection of our of mountain lions for CWD positive animals. Um, we've, you know, partnered with the university on some other projects like looking at the use of, um, of cervids, so deer and elk and moose um, the use, their use of salt and mineral licks. There's some theories out there that as these animals are repeatedly licking the same salt blocks or mineral blocks that because prions can be transmitted through saliva, that can be a source of, you know, both environmental and, you know, kind of indirect animal to animal um, transmission. So in this particular study, we, you know, did a trip, well, the university, I should say, did a, a trail camera study at 49 different sites and analyzed, you know, in the millions of photos actually and it's kind of what they found is then well i guess that the treatment of the study was then to to utilize um some excluder feeders that are designed to actually exclude wildlife but cows can be readily trained to access the mineral and salt blocks within and we found that that use of these new excluders actually was really effective at excluding mule deer um uh elk and moose all together but also, it reduced just the amount of time mule deer are even trying to visit these sites in general. We've also partnered in studies with, you know, um, looking at things like modeling um, potential impacts of CWD as CWD makes its way into our elk feed ground herds. Anyone that follows Game and Fish stuff knows that we've just recently gone through an exhaustive public input process on, uh, on our developing a feed ground management plan. Um, certainly, you know, as, as CWD inevitably makes its way towards our elk feed ground herds, it's something that we, uh, we certainly have a lot of concern with. So what have we done in light of all this since 2020? Well, um, we, we went through a very, very long, intensive collaborative learning process where we assembled a stakeholder group of 31 individuals and met over the course of almost two years, and we developed our Game and Fish Commission approved CWD management plan, which ultimately was adopted in 2020. Um, we continue to do our, our intensive statewide surveillance and monitoring, which Jessica touched on. Um, we're starting to implement some harvest strategies um, to, to try to combat CWD. That's kind of one of the primary components of the, of the management plan. We're continuing to lead or collaborate on research and we're pursuing some additional regulatory actions and just trying to stay abreast of emerging research. So really, really quickly here, I'll touch on just a few of the basic tenets of, of Wyoming CWD plan. And that is, you know, we, we primarily want to address artificial sources of, of animal concentration, um, utilize hunter harvest management strategies to try to, to, to reduce CWD prevalence to the extent possible and then employ some of those additional agency and regulatory actions. So. Um, with enhanced surveillance, I'll kind of skip through some of that as Jessica touched on it, but um, one of the things that we are trying to do is identify hotspots for CWD density reductions and our new more robust surveillance program 
over the past five years has, has enabled us to begin to do that. Um, we, we utilize mandatory sample submission in some areas where, whereby we require all harvested deer or elk, depending on, on the area, to actually all hunters to submit samples to us for, for CWD monitoring. Um, we, you know, incentivize things and that sort of thing as well. Um, harvest management's kind of, you know, the, probably the, the biggest 800 pound gorilla with respect to CWD management. It's probably the number one thing that we can do, but it's also can be the most controversial, um, you know, based on knowledge that we have of CWD, just like Jessica talked about where we, where we do see prevalence highest in our adult bucks. There's certain things that we do know. We do know that this, this disease tends to concentrate more in some spots on the landscape than others. So, so our plan is to try to utilize hunter harvest strategies to the best of our ability to decrease or stabilize CWD prevalence. And when we start talking about things like reducing buck ratios, those can prove quite controversial. Anyone that lives in Wyoming knows our mule deer populations have been struggling for a long time. In an awful lot of the state, mule deer numbers are about as low as they've been in most folks' lifetime. So um, it's a real challenge for us. Um, but nevertheless, we still feel like it's the right thing to do. So just to give you guys a, just a, a small example of, of, say, a hunter harvest strategy that we may employ. This is a herd just west of Casper. This is our rattlesnake mule deer herd. So it's deer hunt areas 88 and 89. Um, immediately west of Casper, you're going to see in the dark red here some real hot spots. Almost all of this hunt area is, is agricultural. It's, it, it's mostly center pivots and um, you know, irrigated hay fields. It's, there's a big irrigation district there. In those cases, we see CWD at a much higher prevalence than we do when you go just to the west in the same herd in area 89 and like the Rattlesnake Hills. And, and so in this case, we have actually increased some doe harvest to reduce densities in some of these ag hot spots. And, the, and as what we found is that we have CWD at a much lower prevalence in those deer that are utilizing those uplands in, in Hunter 89. And 89, by the way, is, is one of the most sought after deer tags in the whole state. So anything we can do to try to minimize prevalence in our bucks there, I think is a good thing. And, and, and that may come at the expense of having to reduce and may keep lower densities of deer in Hunter 88. Um, another quick example is just around the project herd again. So all you can see all the, the dark red hot spots there, that's that, that Riverton Pavilion ag country Again, extraordinarily high prevalence there. Um, our Lander region has, has um, really tried hard to implement some density reductions through doe harvest, um, reduce buck numbers and buck you know, ratios through increased um, just you know, type one buck licenses, that sort of thing. Um, invoked mandatory sampling to better understand the implications of those actions. And so, it, um, it, you know, with all these studies, we're still basically in, in the learning process. To, we're still trying to understand the effect of, of our management, but it's, it's management that we're implementing because we think it's the right thing to do. And, and we think based on what we know from the disease that it'll be effective in reducing transmission. We've also proposed some other things like some late season hunts around down by Laramie and Wheatland that uh, ultimately those proposals have been abandoned because they've just proven really controversial because there's just places where anytime we talk about increasing buck mule deer harvest, you know, folks for, for understandable reasons are just concerned because everyone seems to be, you know, everyone is concerned about just declining mule deer numbers. With whitetails, we just essentially use really, really aggressive harvest strategies. That's not all in the name of CWD, but CWD is, is, um, is really now in the, the forefront of most white-tailed deer managers' minds when they're formulating their season recommendations. Whitetails in the vast majority of the state are pretty much private land animals anyway. They tend to primarily occur on cultivated fields and riparian areas. Um, but in an awful lot of the state, we are seeing prevalence in our whitetail populations that are metering, exceeding that of mule deer. So one of the levers that we can pull is to try to keep whitetail densities a little bit lower in the hopes that it minimizes um, pre on concentration in the environment and or, you know, transmission to mule deer. Some, an example of some agency and regulatory actions that we've pursued are some feeding bans in various communities, 
like munis municipalities like Newcastle and Sundance and the city of Casper. Um, those are things we hope uh, can, can maybe at least reduce transmission within these urban deer herds. For example, in the city of Sundance, we see CWD at a much higher prevalence than we do just in the surrounding Black Hills just outside of town. Um, we, we do test and, and remove any cervid that we, that we think is showing signs of CWD. It's really critical for us to do this on, on elk feed grounds. Um, and we certainly advocate for proper par carcass disposal. So where do we go from here? You know, I think we still need as an agency more field tested management research. There's been a lot of predictive modeling studies that have come out that, that shows potential for effective management strategies, but a lot of them, for the most part, they haven't really been rigorously tested in the environment. So that's something that we're, we're actively pursuing. We still need to continue to develop a comprehensive list of, of needed management actions across the state. It's something that we as an agency have really, really dove deep into over the last four years or so. Um, and we need to be adaptive with whatever management strategies that we implement. Um, this is a learning process for all of us and, and it's something that uh, we need to continue to go forward with. So the last slide I have, is, or second to the last slide is basically where do we go from here? We still need to continue to try to build broad and diverse public support for these management actions. Cause I, as I briefly touched on, they can prove controversial with the public, but we really feel like it's imperative that we look out for the long-term interests and health of the herds. And if that means short-term sacrifices for hopefully long-term gains, we feel like it's the right thing to do. Um, we have to recognize that any management strategies that we embark on are, do require some experimentation just because they haven't really been validated with field research and that, you know, we are going to, as, as we embark on these, we are going to ensure that they're grounded in the best available science and, and acceptable wildlife management practices. So they're going to be utilizing, you know, a reasonable hunting season framework to try to implement these and result in, you know, hopefully, um, deer numbers, buck ratios, things like that, that, that we all can live with. Um, so just to wrap up over the long term, is CWD impacting our mule deer? Well, in places we think absolutely so. But I would like to also stress that even in the face of CWD, when we do have favorable environmental conditions for a, a reasonable period of time, we still can grow mule deer numbers. But where we have a really, really high prevalence of endemic CWD, the, the likelihood is, and this is what we, we're starting to see, is that while we can grow mule deer numbers, the, the, the peaks are not as high as they would have been otherwise, and the valleys or the, you know, the periods of, of population decline are lower than they would have been otherwise. So it's a real challenge. Um, we do think it's a significant deer management concern, and we, we do think it's impacting our populations. That's all I have. Wonderful. Thank you, Justin. Um, and now we're going to open it up to questions and answers. And we already have a couple questions in our, um, our chat panel here. So Josh Evans was asking, uh, one CWD origin hypothesis is that scrapie jumped from domestic sheep to deer. How likely is it that CWD jumps to bighorn sheep? Uh, yeah, Josh, I can try to answer that. So yeah, that is one theory. Um, it was first described at down at CSU in some pens where they had mule deer and there were some scrapie infected sheep there previously. So that is one thought that possibly it could mutated from that. Um, I will say Colorado Parks and Wildlife has actually been doing a very, they published a very thorough study of opportunistic surveillance in bighorn sheep um, starting in 1985. And they tested 127 of their captive facility sheep there in Fort Collins, as well as 152 wild sheep, um, very thoroughly for CWD, and they never found any indication um, behavior-wise, uh, grossly, or through IHC or anything else that mm -hmm. any of them got CWD. Um, and actually, there has been no evidence that a bighorn sheep has ever gotten scrapie either, um, although scrapie is, they're working on to eradicate that from the United States, um, so we definitely don't have it on the landscape uh, like we do CWD. Um, but no evidence right now. So there's probably quite a species barrier between CWD and bighorn sheep. And Meredith, I think that answered your question as well. Yeah, great. Um, and then Carolyn asks, sorry, 
screen just changed here. So Carolyn asked, does game and fish have restrictions to cease hunting on certain species when the severe weather CWD MOVI have seriously impacted herds? And is there criteria that halt population harvest? Is there criteria that halt population harvest that are in place? Well, I mean, yes and no. So um, halt is is kind of a little bit different story. So you know, um, the the participant may be asking in reference to to the Mbovi outbreak in Pronghorn and Sublette County last year coupled with the very severe winter. And so in cases like that, where we have, you know, that was an unprecedented winter for us where, you know, based on collared deer, um, you know, we lost 80% of our Wyoming range herd. Um, and then we, you know, the sublet pronghorn losses were also extraordinary. So, so we don't really have this firm criteria in place that says we will halt hunting, but we have responded with drastic, drastic um, measures in terms of uh, because prescribing the most conservative hunting seasons that we've ever had for both of those species um, in those areas. And it is what that has resulted in is basically just male harvest. So, you know, and, and for the most part, those, those populations were just harvested with males anyway for both pronghorn and mule deer. There hasn't been significant female harvest in those herds for, for quite a while. But, um, but yeah, license quotas now are at, at really bare minimums. You have to recognize there's still a percentage of those animals that did make it through the winter and very conservative harvest just on your males um, is not going to impact the, the population's productivity going forward. Great. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Josh says that there's a study and he um, has that study linked here in the chat box that indicates mountain lions digestive tracts destroy CWD. Has there been a comparison between CWD spread and the prevalence in areas with mountain lions like the Western United States versus areas relying solely on human hunting like the Eastern US? Well, Jessica, you can jump in here too. You know, I mean, I, I, I guess the short answer would be no, not that I'm aware of. You know, I think CWD spread to the Midwest and the Eastern part of the country an awful lot of it, depending on the state you talk to, can be attributed to the captive servant industry with, with animals being shipped across the country. So to make, I guess I'm not 100% sure I understand the question correctly, but as far as, as mountain lions being responsible for spreading CWD, if that's the question, um, I, would, I would say that, you know, it's not to say that there's no risk that they can, but the digestive tract does predominantly denature most of those prions. And we always have to remember that animals, depending on whether deer or elk, can, the incubation of that of disease, the incubation period can be a year and a half to two years in deer, two to four years in elk, that, that, that dispersal movements from deer and elk are much more likely to spread that disease on the landscape than any predator. Thank yeah, you. and I would say to add to Justin, um, that yes, it does look like with some of these initial studies that, it, that they do inactivate some of these prions coming out. But I think the bigger part that mountain lions probably play with CWD is, um, you know, they're taking out these, like I said, you know, you don't see a lot on the landscape that are in that clinical phase because they're getting taken out sooner. And mountain lions are helping with that process, right? They're getting those animals um, that are CWD positive probably off the landscape sooner. So they're not out there continuing to spread CWD into the landscape. Um, and it's a bonus that what they're eating um, is not passing through and just coming right out of them, that they are inactivating some of that. Um, but I think them just helping get some of those positives off the landscape is kind of reducing those numbers of positives in the population. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's been a couple different studies that, that have shown a clear selection for mountain lions for CWD positive animals, meaning that they're killing a higher percentage of CWD positive animals that otherwise occur on the landscape as can be detected through just general hunter harvest. So some of the mountain lion stuff that I very briefly touched on was actually a project of mine just south of Casper. And, you know, we we also kind of corroborated that with, with our study, but the ultimate goal, and we're still waiting for, for the mule deer collaring portion of it to be done, is basically to touch on what Jessica just said, is that to really try to figure out um, through actual field data 
whether or not lion predation is an additive source of mortality on those mule deer because they're already struggling in the face of CWD or is it compensatory or like potentially mitigating in terms of reducing transmission. So, so even though that population is struggling for various reasons, is lion predation potentially helping mitigate CWD transmission and therefore increasing survival over the long run? Okay, and feel free to unmute at this time and ask any questions freely. Um, Josh also asks here, is it likely that CWD can be bred out through natural genetic resistance in reference to Dr. Seabury's research at the Texas A&M, which I kind of brought up earlier when we were having a discussion. Um, I would say, you know, like with Scrapey, they have started an eradication program. And with Scrapey, when we were talking about the PRNP, one of the polymorphisms for Scrapey is very resistant to getting scrapey. So you can select genetically and you can breed um, because again, they're domestic species as well, right? So it's easy to set up a breeding program and you know the genetics, you test everything um, and you make sure you're setting up those polymorphisms to where you have a really high resistance. And that is what they have been able to do with scrapey and what they're continuing to do. Um, the resistance is not that strong, at least what we've seen so far in these cervids. Um, they still get it. They are going to die from it. That would be extremely hard. Um, and breeding it out in the wild is going to be impossible, right? Um, I'm, I'm sure game farms are looking at that as potentially a way for them to stay in business. Um, but for the moment, there just doesn't seem to be one of those polymorphisms that gives enough. Um, it just doesn't prevent it completely. It, it, there's no cure out there right now in cervids. One of the other, you know, things that we've certainly partnered with and continue to look at, especially folks like Jessica look at, are, you know, the genotyping of those animals. So, so there's a genetic makeup for deer and elk bull that depending on, on the alleles that they have at a certain gene can be potentially a little bit more resistant to CWD in terms of they, they tend to get it at a lower prevalence, but and they also live on average about twice as long with the disease as those that, that have um, the more traditional genetic makeup. And so we have seen in places in Wyoming with high endemic CWD, a little bit of a shift um, genetically towards a higher percentage of animals in the population that have that genotype where they live a little bit longer. But that's not to infer that that's any kind of um, genetic selection against CWD. We just don't know. We also know the percentage of those animals in those populations with that genetic, with that genotype tend to be pretty low. And so not sure if there's other fitness characteristics associated with that genetic makeup. But at the end of the day, even with that, there's no true resistance. They still all ultimately succumb and die from the disease. And then the other question that it begs is if they're also living twice as long with that genetic makeup once they contract CWD or else they also are potentially shedding it in the environment twice as long. And so is, is that a good thing or not? We just don't know, but it's something, it's something CWD researchers are certainly looking at. And it's my understanding that in the wild, there's never been an entire population that's been wiped out by CWD, but in one of the instances in Texas where they were breeding, they did accidentally wipe out an entire herd um, just because there's one that they didn't catch with the breeding male. And it's just a really interesting study. <clears throat> yeah, and it, certainly you have, you know, you have the confined higher densities in a captive situation like that that just are not applicable to, to our free-ranging populations in Wyoming. But I can tell you that, you know, when some of the early work was done describing CWD's potential impacts on populations, um, you know, there were some predictions made 25 years ago that based on, on what we we're seeing, what they were seeing with survival rates and things like that, that it, it actually could potentially cause population extinction. And the reality is that's never manifested. And, and I don't think any serious CWD researcher thinks that actually would happen now in free ranging populations, but the, you know, but that's not to say that they still couldn't, you know, be responsible for suppressing the performance of that population over the long term. So, We've seen it like in our in, in Southeast Wyoming where we've had it the longest. We've seen prevalence ebb and flow where it got up into the 30s and 40 percentile. And, in, and now as populations are so much further reduced, we've seen 
prevalence modulate in recent years to where now we're seeing it in the 20 to 25% range, depending on the herd you look at. Um, but deer densities, unfortunately, are so much lower as a result. Thank you. Any other questions that we have at this time? All right, well, thank you so much, Jessica and Justin. Really appreciate all the research that you're doing um, and just coming here today and, and presenting to us uh, with this information. We are very grateful and to Wyoming Game and Fish for all the research that continues to be done and the things that you're trying to do to help out this uh, situation. Um, and I'd like to invite everybody to join us next month on April 25th as we present about trails, tracks, and migration corridors. That should be a pretty interesting um, wild sheep webinar. Thank you everyone for participating today and for all your questions. They were very helpful. Have a good Thanks evening. for having us, Amanda. You yeah, bet. thank you. Good night.